Good evening, everyone. As you saw, we are migrant farm workers, migrant fisheries workers, care workers, student workers, non-status and undocumented people. And together, we are the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. Woo! You'll see at the front that our members have carried things and items that we use to work, to live, to make the world that we live in. It's the gloves we wear to pick fruits. It's our muddy boots. It's the shovel that we use to dig into the earth. Our work uniforms as we move from healthcare facility to uh, employer's home to healthcare facility. The bag that international students use to deliver food through cold and snow. These are the things, and these things have life. And we as migrants work with these things, use them in our day to day to make this world possible. Many of our members are not able to be with us today. They're working and don't get breaks. They live in Niagara, Leamington, Okanogan Valley, Moncton, Charlottetown. They're all over the country. But by carrying these items in, we want to take this moment to bring them into the space with us. Our collective task is to build a better world. And in order to do that, we need to, one, win permanent residence status for all. And for that, we must pick each other up, hold each other down, and raise our consciousness, our spirit together, our revolutionary spirit together. My name is Saron Rowe. I'm a staff organizer and member of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and one of your MCs today. And I'm Alex Blanchet, and I'm with the Society for the Anthropology of Work that has helped organize this event. I am a migrant worker from the Korean Peninsula. And I want to really welcome you into today's talk. I mean, you're here because you want to hear from movement giants like uh, Harsha and Islam, movement teachers, but also friends and comrades and organizers. And they'll be in conversation with critical thinkers like Gilberto, um, and critical thinkers and organizers like many of you in the crowd today. Today, we're gathered in a place called Toronto, and our struggle continues on stolen and unceded lands. All of Canada is on unceded land. And this territory that we're on has been taken care of and defended by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the, of, the first, of the Credit First Nations. This land is also governed with the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which is a binding promise to take care and protect the land together. As migrants and as working class people, it's our responsibility to understand that the land has been stolen from, not only in terms of the land itself and the resources, but also the theft of people. So many of our sisters are missing, and for months, as you know, indigenous uh, people have been calling on the government of Manitoba to search the landfills so that the bodies and spirits of their family members can be returned to them and their communities. But this world also lives and breathes, and by constantly uniting and struggling together, we're moving history, we're making history. Six weeks ago, just a few steps from here actually, um, in front of the Legislative Assembly, five indigenous nations in Ontario formed a historic alliance called the Land Defense Alliance to say that there will be no bulldozing on their lands by the Ford government and by multimillionaire corporations. This is struggle, this is unity, this is power. And so today, we're going to be talking about those things. And that's what you want to hear about, right? So I'm going to pass the uh, mic to Alex to give a rundown of the day. Um, but fundamentally, um, let's sit with the call for land back, which is so clear, right? The land must be returned. It has to be seized, re-expropriated, and returned to indigenous people. And for that, we must continue to struggle together. And winning permanent residence status for all is just one part of that. Thank you.
I'll be brief. I just want to give you a sense of how the evening's going to go, introduce the speakers, and then get out of the way and let them do their magic. Um, so we're going to start by hearing from some of MWAP's ongoing efforts, some of their current struggles, kind of ground those issues in the room. We're then going to hear from Harsha, who's going to connect work and borders and perhaps think beyond them. Um, we'll then open up for a brief discussion amongst all three panelists. Um, and something I want to emphasize is that, is that this is going to be an open discussion. This is not pre-planned, pre-scripted. Indeed, the three speakers themselves have not fully met each other before this moment. And, but I think they have a lot to say to each other, and it's going to be really fantastic. We'll then break for a bit of a, a fundraiser portion, which is an extremely important part of this evening, particularly to share resources um, and, and you know, build up ongoing struggles on the ground. And then we'll open up for audience Q&A Q &A and open discussion. So briefly, Harsha Walia probably does not need an introduction here, and she's probably one of those people that if I start going with a long introduction, I'll go on for tens and tens of minutes. Um, suffice it to say, she's a relentless and collaborative activist, an organizer, a thinker, um, who's really stayed dedicated for a really long time to struggles on the ground. You know, she's, she's consistently sought to challenge our pervading borders, our pervading atmospheres of racial capitalism and refuse the ongoing reduction and ranking of people. She's part of many books and many organizations, from No One is Illegal to Border and Rule. For a good part of the audience, there's a lot of anthropologists in the room. Gilberto Rosas also needs no introduction. He's an intensely creative and critical anthropologist and ethnographer of U.S.-Mexico borderlands. He's just published a brand new book. I want to make sure I get the title right. Um, this is the year called Unsettling, the El Paso Massacre, Resurgent White Nationalism, and the U.S.-Mexico Border. One that not only excoriates, in my opinion, the discourses that have led to tons of forms of violence in that place, but he also reaches back to earlier times when, say, the El Paso border was a place of different kinds of movements that weren't so militarized and restricted like they are today. He's also the author of Barrio Libre, which is a profound ethnography of youth criminalization and resistance on the U.S.-Mexico border. Last but not least, we will also have Syed Hassan, who is the executive director of MWAP and the founder of Remember Jan 29th Project to mark the Quebec mosque shootings. Now, other folks in MWAP told me that Hussan does not like long bios, and so I'm going to leave it there, but we are now going to hear from him. And I just want to emphasize that these are three people um, who are not only um, brilliant thinkers, but they have been committed to struggle on the ground. Let us begin with the absolute certainty. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Will be. It will happen. Without question or doubt, we believe in this future patiently and, yes, relentlessly. Palestine will be free. Because Palestine lives. Palestinians live. Despite the atrocities, in each day they wake up, and as Rafif told us, they teach the rest of us life. Palestinians live clutching keys to their homes, homes to which they will one day more certainly return. Free. In our lifetime, for our ancestors, and for our children. The world we hope for, everything we need is coming. We will not see another child crawling out from the rubble. We will live in a world without war, without rich or poor. We know this, right? 
I know this. I know this in my blood and my bones because I'm here in the midst of a movement and an organization that wakes up every morning and we are told that there is no brightness in our future. We who are tied to our employers, we whose very existence is deemed criminal, illegal, and yet we fight and in the words of prophetic Maya Angelou, still we rise. I come to you from many places I've called home. My grandparents left what is today called India when a border came. My mother was raised in a city, a migrant, a Mahajar. My first protest, aged five, was on my aunt's shoulders in a movement since corrupted. I chanted till I lost my voice, a slogan roughly translated, we will see, the day will come, long live the migrants. To be a migrant, a refugee, displaced on a forced march, in a camp, in a settlement, on a trail, in a shelter, is not a joyous task. It is not a sign of victory. Migration is rarely beautiful, rarely pleasurable. I dream of a world where we move freely, return freely, live freely, where migration is not forced, and then I wake up in this world, and with our comrades we say, long live the migrants. Many years ago, I was at a protest here in Toronto, um, outside a uh, arms manufacturer that was exporting arms to yet another genocidal impulse by the Israeli government. After the march, I was at a bus stop, and I met a woman who just had come outside of that factory. <clears throat> And she told me that she was Palestinian and that she had sharp nails embedded in her head. She came to Canada as a, and that sharp nail, that bomb, <coughs> had been made by SNC Lavalin. And she was a cleaner at SNC Lavalin. She came to Canada, applied for refugee status, and was denied. She stayed here and became undocumented. So she worked as a cleaner in the same factory that made the bomb, that killed her people, and she had sharp nails embedded in her head from. They try to kill us, displace us, steal our food, despoil our water, and then they force us to come here, to clean, to care for them, to feed them. And at every turn, they try to squeeze the life out from us, but we live. Long live. The migrants. 30 years ago, when Canada, the US, and Mexico signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, the right to collective land was abolished. I'm sorry, Roberto knows a lot more about this. <laughs> Forcing hundreds of thousands of peasants and farm workers off their land and into the US, and some here into Canada. Those peasants came here, their families, their neighbors, and their friends came here. And today, Mexican farm workers in Canada grow wheat, canola, flowers, processed beef and pork, which is then dumped into Mexico, and all of it is at cheaper prices than can be produced in Mexico itself. Canada, this place, has some of the highest rates of greenhouse gas emissions, serving as it does as headquarters to nearly 60% of the world's mining companies, pumping poison into the air, changing our climate, drying up our land, impoverishing our people, forcing people from villages into towns, towns into cities, and then to the global south, and some eventually here. And so we say, we are here because you are there. Long live the migrants. Unlike the US, Canada is surrounded on three sides by water, and on the other by the empire. We arrive here as migrants on permits. This year, over one and a half million people will come here on temporary permits, employer restricted, study permits, work permits, refugee claimants. This is a 1,000% expansion over 20 years. Less than a tenth of them will eventually get permanent residency. The rest will be forced to leave or become undocumented. So today, at least one in every 20 people in this country is a migrant, a non-permanent resident. 
In a place like Toronto, that's more like 1 in 12 or 1 in 15. Every 12th person without permanent resident status. At the current rate of growth, it will be 1 in 10 in less than 5 years. From the planting of the food to the harvesting of the crops, to the packaging and the processing, from the truck drivers, to the shelf stockers in the warehouses, to the cleaners, to the security guards at the grocery store, to the dishwashers and chefs at the restaurants, to your delivery worker who brings the food to your home, to the construction worker, to the factory worker, one unbroken chain of the essential, our beloved, the excluded, migrants. The border is not what exists at the periphery, keeping us out. Permanent resident status is not about whether we live here or we don't. We live here in the hundreds of thousands, for years and sometimes decades. We are indentured, made temporary by these permits. We are denied rights at the hospital, in schools, at workplaces. The border reappears again and again, and we try to cross it over and over together. And we live even when shut out. Long live the migrants. What does it mean when at least one in 20 people do not have access to public health care? It means that healthcare here has already been privatized. What does it mean when one in 20 people have to pay tens of thousands of dollars for an education? It means that education has already been privatized. What does it mean when bosses can exploit one in 20 people more? It means the entire labor market has already been suppressed. What does it mean that one in 20 people pay into employment insurance and pension and can't have the money? It means the social welfare system has changed for all of us. What does it mean when one in 20 people can be jailed more, criminalized more, repressed more? It means the most sudden expansion of policing in recent memory. Migration and migrants are not just one issue in a long list of many. Migration policy today here and around the world is the organizing factor. It is the determining method of exclusion and exploitation in the world today, in the country today. It is the petri dish in which the logic that comes to the rest of you or the rest of us is tested. And our journeys, all our journeys to justice and dignity will only happen when migrants organize, migrants fight, and when migrants win. Long live the migrants. And despite the threat of deportation, living under the heavy burden of debt, denied life-saving care, separated from our families, migrants are winning every day. When in COVID-19, many people stepped into their homes, we organized over 150 protests across this country, in dozens of cities. In the last three years, migrants have stopped over 100,000 deportations, by winning renewal of postgraduate work permits. Migrants won permanent residency for 85,000 low-wage workers for the first time. Migrants won labor mobility rights for half a million international students. Migrants made it easier for some migrant workers to be able to get permanent resident status. And for the first time now, migrants are able to study, some of them, and some can bring their families to them. Long live the migrants. And our victory is not in winning better laws from a settler colony. Our eek writes out of the empire. We are building a democratic organization of migrants. Migrants on farms and in fishery plants, in long-term care homes, in domestic work, and on school campuses. You see us, we are here. Migrants are fighting for themselves first and foremost then for those who are closest to them, and then for all migrants, and then for the entire working class. A step-by-step -step process of collective political conscientization where we're winning wages and rights and building power. A people's movement, a powerful movement, a unified movement that exists at every choke point of capitalist power, which one day, one day soon, will have the power to stop everything as it is and build everything that will be that we need everything long live the migrants
Thank you so much, son. Long live the migrants. And next, we'll welcome onto the stage uh, Harsha Walia. Maybe we can give it up for her as she comes up. Good evening, everyone. No one is illegal, Canada is illegal. Can we say that? No one is illegal, Canada is illegal. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Um, my apologies for this late start. That was all me. I got, I got lost and delayed. But for good reason, because we were all in the streets for Palestine, yeah? Yeah. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to the organizers, to MWAC, to Alex and Jenny and the folks in anthropology. And this is an MWAC fundraiser, which I know is coming later, but let me start by saying, please give your money to MWAC. Whatever money you are able to spare at the door, please drop it for MWAC. MWAC is building, as we've heard, a member-led organization of migrant farm workers, of care workers, of students. We see this here. And much more to win. Worker justice, economic justice, migrant justice, and struggles in support of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism. So can you raise your hand if you're going to drop some money for MWAC on your way out? Whatever it is, whatever amount it is, thank you. Thank you for supporting this work. I also want to express my gratitude. Did I hustle money well? <laughs> I just, I saw that. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to the so many movement formations here in the city that have taught me over the past several decades. That includes No More Stolen Sisters, Migrant Rights Network, MWAC, No One Is Illegal, OCAP, Butterfly, PYM, No Pride in Policing Coalition, the Workers' Action Center, the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid, Jane and Finch Action Against Poverty, and so many others. You have all for so long and continue to articulate and dismantle borders and make revolution and abolition in your lifetime. So my gratitude to the city for growing me and growing all of us in so many different ways. We're also here in our rage and our grief and our solidarity for the Palestinian people. We're watching a genocide and a colonial occupation unfold in real time with one out of every 200 people in Gaza being killed in the past six weeks. Since the Nakba, Palestinians have endured endless war crimes, bombing campaigns, and military offensives, the naval blockade and land siege of the Gaza Strip and apartheid wall, expansion of illegal settlements, demolitions of their homes, martial law in the West Bank, land laws that continue to steal Palestinian farms, thousands of incarcerated Palestinian political prisoners, and ethnic cleansing at the hands of the Zionist entity whose stated explicit purpose is to obtain the maximum amount of Palestinian land without Palestinian people. But we know that in our lifetime, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. These lands that we're on, Canada, shares a settler colonial intent and project and premise with Israel. This extends to the ways in which both Canada and Israel extract land and exploit labor. Earlier this week, for example, Israel asked its equally fascist ally of the Indian government to allow Israeli companies to hire up to 100,000 workers from India to replace the 90,000 Palestinians who have recently had their work permits revoked. Major trade unions in India responded by showing solidarity with Palestinians by refusing to replace them. In their statement, quote, they said, Nothing could be more immoral and disastrous for Indian workers than the said export of us workers to Israel. <clears throat> Such a step will amount to complicity on India's part with Israel's ongoing genocidal war, which of course we know India is completely complicit and active in, against Palestinians and will naturally have adverse implications for Indian workers in the entire region, end quote. In light of this agreement and in a time of genocidal warfare and attack on Palestinians, where Palestinians are under siege in an open-air prison, where the Rafa border is closed, where one million are displaced and refugees are unable to return, I wanted to offer three threads regarding borders. 
I'm not intending to offer anything too prescriptive tonight, but I hope in this moment it can move us towards action. And also because podiums like this generate a strange dynamic, I just want to emphasize that everything that I'm saying here comes from within and alongside collectives, community networks, and constellations of comrades, many of whom are in this room. The first point that I want to make is the centrality of the border logic today. As SK said, migrant struggles are central to so many of our struggles. With resurgent white nationalist, anti-trans, and xenophobic fascism, the border is a central site of struggle. Far-right appeals target foreigners for stealing our jobs, driving up our housing prices, draining our services, ruining our environment, infecting our neighborhoods, all in quotes, of course, and tainting our so-called values. This is not only racist, but it also deflects responsibility from the capitalist colonial oppressive systems producing mass inequality, impoverishment, and misery by conveniently scapegoating migrants. We know, for example, that the housing crisis we're facing is not due to migrants, but is a symptom of the ongoing dispossession rooted in colonialism and the commodification of housing under capitalism. I want to propose further, it is not just that the border is a linchpin in fascist ideologies today, but that fascism is itself constituted through the border. Fascist tendencies and the violence of seemingly fringe far-right groups require the quotidian state violence of the border. The exclusionary projection of who belongs, who doesn't, who is more worthy, who is not, who can live where and under what conditions is possible because of an enduring global racial apartheid that borders uphold. Many Canadian immigration laws have long been written through explicit racial exclusion, such as the Chinese Exclusion Act, vagrancy laws that deported the poor or those deemed criminal, attacks on labor unionism were carried out through the expulsion of communists and anarchists, many laws excluded single women migrants deemed to be sex workers, and medical examination was and is a continued basis for excluding disabled migrants. The mass production and social organization of difference is at the heart of border craft, making both the so-called good versus bad migrant, as well as maintaining the colonial, racial, gendered, sexualized, ableist, and classist orderings amongst all of us that fascism relies on. In Europe, in the US, and in Canada, recent surveys have shown that anti-immigrant sentiments bound up in Islamophobia is the primary reason voters support far-right electoral parties. This means that our responses to far-right escalating fascism cannot be through liberal moralizing about how good immigrants are or how much immigrants contribute or integrate. We must strike at the heart of fascism itself, which is to say to be anti-fascist is to abolish the border. Our, our enemy today arrives in a limousine and not on a boat, and our fiercely internationalist struggles are not against so-called foreigners, but against any and all oppressors. The second point that I want to make is that immobility and displacement, not free movement, are the defining realities of our era. The global migration crisis is better understood as a crisis of mass displacement and the systemic, systematic constriction of human mobility. The total number of migrants worldwide today has reached almost 5% of the world's population. An emphasis on displacement rather than migration forces us to interrogate the real drivers of this displacement, conquest, capitalism, and climate change. Palestinians for, day, for, for example today are considered in kind of UN policy speak as the world's quote most protracted refugee population. The Palestinian refugee crisis as we know is inextricable from the ongoing Zionist occupation of Palestine since 1948 and the ongoing freedom struggle for Palestine from the river to the sea. This is why so many movements say, we are here because you are there. We cannot talk about immigration as a domesticated policy issue. This is not about quotas or legality or humanitarianism or space and resources. This is about global capitalism, white supremacy, class, gender, caste, imperialism, and so on. Today, displacements are escalating with climate disasters. Around the world, an estimated one person every two seconds is being displaced due to a climate catastrophe. Further, when we say migration, a migration crisis, we tend to assume that millions of displaced pushbacks, restricted visa requirements, smart AI borders, and more. 
But language such as border crisis or migrant crisis is an excuse to further harden borders and depict and villainize migrants and refugees, especially those who are black, indigenous, and or Muslim. We see the racial colonial pillars of bordering regimes most starkly in the global response to Ukrainian refugees, including the racial differentiation of black, racialized Muslim and Roma people fleeing, fleeing Ukraine. Increasingly, borders are being outsourced so that border violence is happening far beyond the territorial border itself. Put another way, the border is elastic and the magical line can exist anywhere. It can extend far within and far beyond the border, and it can take many forms. Canada, for example, does not need a big border wall because we have the Safe Third Country Agreement, first implemented by the Liberals in 2004 and recently expanded by Justin Trudeau. This agreement forbids people who arrive in Canada at official land ports of entry from making a refugee claim, and when it was first implemented, asylum claims in Canada dropped by over 30%. As legal routes became closed, people are continuously forced to rely on more and more irregular and unsafe and dangerous routes, where death is inevitable, as we saw in the horrific deaths of eight migrants in the river on Akwesasne territory earlier this year. Similarly, the U.S. is funding immigration enforcement deep in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and Colombia to prevent people from even reaching the U.S.-Mexico border. Shortly after the U.S. launched the Mexico-Guatemala-Belize border region program, Department of Homeland Security officials declared that, quote, the Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border. Mexico now has one of the world's largest immigration detention systems and deports more Central Americans than the U.S. Let that sink in. This is happening around the world, including the horrors we see unfolding in Europe and the Mediterranean, and this is because countries like Nairu, Libya, Mali, Mexico, Niger, Papua New Guinea, Rwanda, Turkey, and Sudan are becoming the new frontiers of border militarization. The outsourcing of border violence in this way is not only globalizing the violence of borders, it is also becoming an additional means of preserving global imperial relations. As countries in the global south are forced to accept migration checkpoints, migration deterrence campaigns, and outsourced immigration detention centers, in exchange for trade and aid. At the same time, migrants are routinely victim blamed for their own deaths. Why did they cross the desert in the heat? Why did they put their children on a flimsy dinghy? Much like victim blaming discourses in rape culture, these kinds of victim blaming responses are intended to shift responsibility away from bordering regimes that constrict migrant immobility and vulnerability. And to add insult to injury, the new mantra of smuggling, trafficking, and organized crime is becoming the latest means to launder further violence. These crackdowns and further criminalization, especially on migrant sex, sex workers, as the work of Butterfly here locally highlights, are often justified as rescue operations and grossly analogized to modern day, quote, anti-slavery efforts. This is a crisis not of the border, but due to the border. People are not illegal, people are made illegal by the border. I want to share a quick story that ties some of this in. As some of you all probably know, Canada has an intensive resource extractive economy, one that is heavily dependent on the extraction of resources locally and globally. 75% of the world's mining companies are headquartered in Canada. There is no continent on this earth where a Canadian mining company or its subsidiary does not operate. And many of these companies are notorious for human rights violations, for environmental degradation, for paramilitary deaths of land defenders, for poisoning the water, and for displacing entire communities. About a, oh, eight years ago, about eight years ago, we were contacted by family members of undocumented workers who were subjected to an immigration raid on a construction site. A side story here is that this raid was being filmed by a really shitty reality TV show called Border Security. Has anyone heard of this yeah. show? Yeah, so it's a shitty law enforcement show where cameras are embedded into CBSA. If you haven't heard about it, don't watch this show. Um, the good news is that we actually were able to shut this show down. So if you're watching it now, it's all reruns. This was, yeah, an important victory to get this show off the air. But that raid that was being filmed was of, was of a construction site in Vancouver, and a number of Central American undocumented workers were detained. Among the detained workers were two cousins who told us that they had fled their home villages in Honduras because their uncle had been involved in a fight against a Canadian mining company. 
as well as a number of other forces that were usurping their land and their villages and their home community. So they fled after their uncle was, was targeted and they made their way to Canada. When they arrived to Canada, they were asked how to seek safety in Canada and they were told, and rightfully so, that you can't tell a story about fleeing violence that involved a Canadian mining company because there was no way that an immigration refugee judge would buy that story because that would mean that Canada would have to accept that these two cousins were fleeing persecution that Canada had effectively caused. And so they told the more palatable and more stereotypical story of fleeing drug traffickers. And because this wasn't actually their story, they were found not to be credible and they failed their refugee hearing and they became undocumented. I think about these two and of course so many more so often because there are so many stories of people who are coming to Canada because of violence that Canada is implicated in but we act as if the migrants and refugees just happen to arrive at the border. Perhaps most ironically and offensively, the migration crisis is declared a so-called new crisis with Western countries positioned as its primary victims, even though for four centuries, nearly 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while four million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered across the globe, and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved 15 million Africans. Colonialism, genocide, slavery, indentureship, and extraction are completely erased in current invocations of a so-called migration crisis, even though they are the very conditions of possibility for displacement today. Police, prisons, borders all operate through the shared logic of immobilization. Notably, the word mob, a criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of poor, racialized people to social disorder, including in inner cities and at the border, derives from the word mobility. In fact, what we are witnessing is a relentless crisis of immobility across and within borders. While migration is typically analyzed through borders and bordering, what I think we can think through is how to think about displacement and immobility more expansively which allows us to see how the border, the prison, the sweatshop floor, the refugee camp, the reservation, the gentrified gated community are all immobilizing regimes that operate through dispossession, capture, enclosure, and criminalization. These are all bordering regimes, or we could say ordering regimes, that manufacture and discipline and immobilize populations under capitalism and colonialism. As Angela Davis and Gina Dent write, quote, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border, end quote. The prison is a border and the border is a prison and borders and prisons must be abolished. The last point I wanna make is that this immobility is produced and reproduces social and labor on freedom. Borders are not intended to exclude or deport all people, but to create conditions of deportability. Workers' labor power is captured and immobilized by the border, and this pliable labor is exploited by bosses. After its formal inception in 1924, U.S. Border Patrol was actually overseen by the Department of Labor. Capitalism requires labor to be constantly segmented, and the border acts as a spatial fix for capitalism by bifurcating the labor force. According to one study, 52% of companies in the United States threatened to call immigration authorities on workers during union drives. This shows us that the work that the border works in the interests of capital and not against it. This is why some of those on the left who believe that somehow more border enforcement is better for workers are completely racist and misdirected. Migrant workers do not suppress wages, bosses, and borders do. While workers are declared illegal, the surplus value they create is never deemed illegal. And this is the reality of why we have to support organizations like MWAC and MRN, because Canada's internationally lauded model of permanent temporary work is a perfected system of managed migration that ensures the steady supply of cheapened, disciplined labor indentured to an employer while further entrenching racialized citizenship. The precarity and disposability of migrant workers is specifically because of their migrant status produced by the border. This is not because of just a few simple bad employers. This is the relationship between the border and bosses. This is why so many migrant worker organizations are calling for full immigration status and are calling for struggles to understand that migrant worker struggles today are the heart of class struggles against capitalism. 
This is why it is essential for anti-capitalist movements to echo the internationalist call for full immigration status for all workers, effectively making the border obsolete. Papers for all or no papers at all. <laughs> to conclude, borders are not lines marking territory. They are shaped by and shape social relations. Borders are race-making, property-protecting, and labor-suppressing regimes of immobility. Put another way, borders maintain asymmetric relations of wealth accrued from colonial impoverishment, of mobility for some, and mass immobility and containment for most. Essentially, a divided working class and system of global apartheid. We often naturalize the existence of borders, which removes them from their long historical and contemporary entanglement with empire. Edward Said wrote of the so-called post-colonial period, quote, the newly triumphant politicians seem to require borders and passports first of all, end quote. In Home, Toni Morrison describes, quote, the contemporary world's work has become policing, halting, forming policy regarding and trying to administer the movement of people, end quote. A world without borders is not the same as a world with open borders. In an open borders world, the world stays configured the way it currently is, with massive inequality, mass displacement, and continued hierarchical differentiation, except borders are opened up. If people are still being forced from their lands and some parts of the world are being plundered as sacrifice zones for others, that is not migrant justice. A no borders politics is more expansive. It calls on us to fight for freedom and to fight against all forms of displacement and immobility. The battle against borders is necessarily inclusive of movements against gentrification, of liberation struggles against colonial occupation, of the fight to be free from policing and cages of bosses and banks, of the dream articulated by queer, trans, feminist, and disability justice movements of being at home in our bodies, and to ensure a habitable earth for all living creatures. It centers the right to stay, the right to move, and the right to return. In the words of Eduardo Galeano, the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. And while this world without borders certainly requires us to stretch our imaginations, no borders is also a present day practical politics. Over the past 20 years, we have had a number of movement campaigns such as education not deportation, transportation not deportation, and shelter sanctuary status to remind our comrades, nurses, teachers, social workers, transit workers, that their work should not involve becoming border guards. The Migrant Rights Network, for example, is fighting for immigration status for all migrants and refugees, and labor protections and universal public services for all. These kinds of fights render the border obsolete and strengthens our fight against austerity for all people. No Borders, then, is a way of analyzing the world. It offers a futurist vision. It is an internationalist framework for relationality and solidarity. No Borders is a present-day form of politics. No Borders is abolitionist imagination as reality. Empires crumble. Capitalism is not inevitable. Gender is not biology. Whiteness is not immutable. And prisons are not as inescapable. And borders are certainly not fucking natural law. And all the walls and all, the and all of the cages that we are surrounded by will fall. We will have border abolition in our lifetime. And Hilberto, join Hansha on the stage. Let's give it up for them. As Hansha said, migrant workers and undocumented people don't suppress wages. Capitalists and colonial borders and bosses do. And we're constantly fighting back. And so. It's really papers for all, or no papers at all, so thank you. Um, Gilberto is going to uh, say, share some thoughts uh, based on Harsha's talk, and then we'll hear from Hassan, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion if we feel up for it. After that, we are going to hear from some of our members. Maybe, it, do our members want to give a little shout at the back there? Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Maybe they're, they're outside. Uh, we'll hear from some of our members about the ways that migrant and undocumented people are fighting back and winning, and uh, our new project that you can all make solidarity contributions to. And then after that, we'll open the floor to Q&A and wrap it up for the day. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. 
Good evening. I really like the phrase, long live the migrants. Que viva los migrantes. Que viva! Que viva! So, where to begin? It's hard to follow Harsha Wally and keep talking about borders. I think I have to say. <laughs> Um, I, thoughts, questions, comments. The interlocking struggles around walls, around the militarization of borders, around the policing of migrant and, and the migrant resembling is foundational to my work, to people I work with in the U.S. Mexico borderlands and elsewhere in Mexico and farther south. I, I, I just wrote a book recently on the, on the mass shooting at Middle Pass in, in 2019 by a, a white nationalist. And the far right is the, is, is the extreme far right is always the target of liberal discourse. Many of us in here know that that is not the problem, and it echoes Harsha's analysis spot on. I argue in the book that what culminates in that hor horrific act where some 28 people were shot, hundreds of others were wounded on August 3rd, 2019, what culminates in that event is years upon years upon years of U.S.-Mexico border policy, and its conjunctions with racial capitalism, etc. colonialist logics. Borders mark stolen land, and borders shake. This is to say that I am, I think we need to very precisely be critiquing and this again echoing Arsha and Wally's fantastic talk. The states and the borders at the site for abolition. And to recall that borders are to entering into conversations about borders and about migrants must be linked with questions of federal logics playing out in everyday life. Case in point is Gaza today. Case in point is how how border technologies, border policing, border, the technologies of border death, the weaponization of the desert, the weaponization of the seas by states are produced by logic of empire. Uh, the borders are internalized, yes, but also Israel comes back and then teaches U.S. Mexico border guards. So there's this complex dialectic between the externalization of borders and the re-internalization into the core countries. And indeed, when I say the border, in my, in my, in my world, it, it is the U.S. Mexico border, and Canada is often taken as, well, the border that you can cross rather easily. I, um, our work does it as a mind. We, we track 30 years of border militarization, how it link it up with white supremacy, how it stages, how it creates fissures or vigilantes and, and other extre extremists then inhabit. but it simultaneously generates movements of migrants.
excitement, yes, but also the people from the border. Border people who are invested in helping people thrive from elsewhere. Um, I, mean, I think there's a really interesting linkage between movement as in the little movement of people across borders and across space and movements as social movements. Mr. Bruce would be interrogated perhaps or talked about by us. And also, and in that respect, I have a good friend who's a historian, and we were talking about, you know, the, the fixation on borders today as, as sites of, of violence and migrant suffering and, you know, policing and the like. And he reminded me, and this is a really key point, and given that I'm in, now in Canada, I'm going to bring it up, that black people fled across borders into Canada for freedom. I'll stop there. Uh, um, I'll just, just speak very briefly um, when I was thinking about what both you have been saying, and particularly the thread around the internationalist working class fight back that's necessary in this moment, because it is this global imperialist uh, organizing logic. Um, about five or so months ago, I'm looking at <laughs> Jess and Lisa getting their dates right, um, we, our members found out that the Jamaican Minister of Labor was going to be coming to the farm. And so, our, so how we organize is we organize committees of migrants on farms and factories, uh, in warehouses, and also kind of a general membership. Uh, and so they found out uh, the f at the farm that they were coming, we had members. And they got together and they wrote an open letter to the Minister of Labor. And they said, we know when you come here, you won't be able to see these things. And that letter they sent to media outlets across Jamaica and to the United States. I'm sorry, to the United States and to Canada. And then the minister came. And when the minister arrived, he basically told them, and we found this, to just shut up and take it. Um, and then the minister left. And this started this massive pushback in Jamaica. People were marching, former farm workers, um, to the point that the Jamaican, that, and they were calling for the Minister of Labor to resign. And so in order to sort of like cover him in his tracks, he announced a, a special inquiry. The head of the, all of the Labor Congress of Jamaica, the head of the Labor Congress and the head of the business associations and three other people were sent to Canada to talk to migrant workers. We organized two meetings, right, Jess? Like about 400 farm workers, 200 each. They didn't come to the first meeting. We organized a second one online. They came and uh, they just told them the truth of what happened sharing these stories of, you know, being forced to work or injured, being yelled at, human rights abuses, like getting sores on their body when they would shower. And they wrote a report saying everything was fine. Um, and then there were just a few troublemakers. But the amount of crisis in Jamaica was such that eventually that minister has since resigned, he's been pushed out, a new minister has now been assigned. Now at the same time, our Mexican migrant worker members were watching all of this, and they decided to go and um, write a letter. When they went back to Mexico, they went to the president's palace, and they forced them to take the letter. And so the Mexican president's office reached out for a meeting with the workers, asking, and they had this meeting, and explain all the issues, and they said, yes, we'll do something about it. This is because the season was ending, right? So the workers are now back in Mexico and Jamaica. Then what happens is the people who wrote that letter, they're all blacklisted. They're not invited to come back to Canada. So they have this seasonal program, so they're barred, the Jamaican workers. Right? So for us, what this means is that suddenly dozens of workers have spoken up, took collective action, and they're barred from the country. 
to an organizing project like ours, that's a death knell, right? You can imagine. Why would people take action? This is, this is clearly what is happening. But then they establish a group in Yemeka, these workers. Right? They start going around filming each other who've been blacklisted. They go, recent, just last week, two weeks ago, they go to the new Minister of Labor and like, we have to meet with you, we need you to fix the problem. This is happening right now. And our members wait three hours for a five minute meeting. And they're like, well, we've been blacklisted, we have nowhere to go. <laughs> We're just gonna sit here and meet with you. And it's this actually created this wave of energy where people are saying, we won't stop even when we're back in Jamaica. We're not gonna stop if we're back in Mexico. We're just going to keep going. So we have now, you know, groups and organizing all over the country. Former farm workers speaking up on the radio, on the national news, talking about, we won't take this, right? This is a program formed over half a century ago. And it's completely shifted the debate to the point that the new Minister of Labor was supposed to come himself to Canada last week. Because it again has to meet with all those, again, he's hearing the truth. He's trying to make these Instagram videos, he's li going live, you know, he's a bit more hip than the last guy. <laughs> Who is like telling the you know, trying to like make it look good. And he's constantly, workers are speaking up on camera. And some even saying like, if we're barred, so what? We're not going to stop. So this momentum that is forming, this transatlantic relationships where Mexican workers are learning from Jamaican workers and taking action no matter what, right? I think we're seeing these slivers of what I think we will need to do uh, in time. It's just, that's it. All right, everyone. So much to think about, and so you can think about some of the questions that you want to ask our panelists, but for now, we're just going to call up uh, Jess and Dave, who are uh, some of the members of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. We're going to share a couple of our stories. And I also want to give a shout out to Jane, and Audrey, and Noah, and Whoa. Samuel, all the members of the Black Workers So as you heard, there are so many ways that employers exploit us, deny us basic rights when we are denied permanent resident status, but we're also fighting back. And the thing is, we live in capitalism. You heard this from our three speakers so clearly, right? Many of you have probably gotten involved in organizing and taking action because of the realities of capitalism we live in. And one of that is that there's a lot of anxiety around money. You know, we're gonna share a couple of our stories, but for me, I actually also got involved because um, I grew up in Flemington Park, which is right next to Thorncliffe Park, where actually three buildings are on rent strike um, against a uh, landlord, which is also a Canadian corporation. Um, but in elementary school, I, mean, I was just going hungry, and so many of, our cl of my classmates too, we were just constantly hungry, thinking about snack time, because our communities just didn't have the money, right? Our parents didn't have the money, our wages were very low. And so this is the daily reality of the world that we live in. At the same time, there are people who do have a different relationship to money, right? Some of us do make more. And so we're going to talk a bit about the project and we're going to do something called stretching a little. We're gonna move collectively and really raise the magic of what it means to move money within our own communities and move money with our own hands. And that doesn't uh, uh, accept any government or corporate funding because we want to keep our politics determined to ourselves. Um, and so let's move some money together. Um, I'm going to also just pass the mic and ask a couple questions to Jess, who is a uh, former farm worker, now undocumented, about the issues and struggles that she went through um, uh, on her farm and how her employer abused her and exploited her, but also how she fought back. Woo! Woo! And her desk. I am Jess, I'm from Jamaica, and I am 35 
years old, a mother of two. He has a 15 and a six year old son. So leaving my country, that's my main reason why I left my country. Like I said, my home is nice, you know? But the economy is not, um, it's not, it's collapsing basically. There's no work infrastructure, so that's the reason why I left my country um, seeking better living conditions for my family and to provide for them. So I was, that's, for me, that's forced labor, but I, I willfully come here, you know? But in doing that, I didn't um, think it was going to be my darkest experience of hell. That's for me. Because Canada, is everybody think or talk about, is a nice place. But for me, that's where my darkness starts. I came here and I was um, refused medical help. So I work on the strawberry farm, so I pick strawberries, apples, help to make sure the grows to look nice going to the basket, right? So that's us. We have to make sure. So in that case, we have to endure all those pesticides before it can reach to you guys. Mm -hmm. So I, I can nail all of that. We have to bend our necks like a donkey all the way down. We can't drink water. We can't eat as regular people would eat when they want to. We go and sometimes eight hours before we can consume food, and that's inhumane for humans. Water, we cannot drink water. So as I said, we're preparing these meals and food and the farms, but we're not living like a regular human being while doing so. So that condition is, is, is I'm like, how can we making stuff for making Canada look nice and beautiful, but we're living in slavement? You know, I'm like, no, my country is better than this. Hmm. So why do I come to a first world country, as they stated, but I'm living like I'm living in a 1920 century? So as I said, Jamaica is a Caribbean, and I stand up to fight for all people, wherever you are. We are here to stand up and watch each other back and fight for status for all. Woo! So, Woo! So leaving, leaving, leaving the farm, I was forced to leave the farm because I was refused health care. So I have to fend for myself, so that makes me become undocumented, which should be a stay place. So I applied for the Canada um, agency to let them know my situation, that I was abused at the farm, and want to have a hope in work permit. As I said, my goal is to provide for my family. I wasn't able to do so, and I'm still intent to do so, because that's the reason why I'm here. Let them know all of that, they still refuse that hope in work permit. So as I said, it's a slave trade. And, and not until these people wake up and realize we're human, we need to live happy just like any other person living in this world. Because when we are in our country, we are happy. So why would you say, welcome you here, but at the borderline, as our members stated, that's where you and us, that slave mark, our slave tattooed on our papers, right, right there you, you <coughs> become our headmaster. This is a third world, first world country, and you're treating us like slave, as I said, I watched the movie, but never knew I would live that story till I come to Canada. And I'm still living like that because I'm, I'm living like rats. I'm hiding from the cops, from the federal government. I cannot work, I'm jobless because I don't have a permit. And as they say, they want to keep us tied. Why do we need to have a work permit to provide for ourselves? Mm -hmm. We're already here. Makes things possible for us to provide because I said, you can't work to provide and you're hiding to do so, you will not accomplish anything, right? So as I said, they, they, they have to stop slave trading, and, 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 and at, at this 2023, they need to do it very fast, because as I said, this new generation, they are coming and they have the sense of knowing what slave look like, and this is slave we are living in. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Diyash. I'm a migrant student. I came in 2019 to this country, hoping it's gonna be a very good thing, moving to another country at young age. But once you go here, the dream you have about this country, it changes, you know, because we don't have a permanent status. So that brings so many different things from other students. And while being here, like you cannot work more than 20 hours, right? because you are not permanent. So that gives a chance to our 
employers. They hire us, they give us full time work, and they pay us on cash. So when I was working with my employer, I have to work more than 20 hours because the tuition fees is so high. There is no other option for international students. So I was working with my employer. He said, oh, you are, you are international. I will help you in your permanent status because uh, I'm going to sponsor you. So I said, I was very young. So I was like, OK, that's a good chance to get permanent. And then I can do whatever I want. While working, I used to work for three years at $10 an hour. And while, like, they offered me $18 on a paper, but they used to pay me $10 because they want to save money, because they have an idea in their mind that they are helping me. So, like, they give me $10 an hour, and on the paper, it was promised $18 an hour. And first, I didn't say anything. I was like, okay, they are helping me. This thing is going to end soon, but it keeps on lasting. It lasts like two, uh, three years. And like I can't even able to finish my studies because I thought they are really going to help me. So while doing this, I used to think and say, what's happening in my life? Like I cannot do anything. Like, like they, they have no rights. And I see other people are also following this path at my workplace. They, the employer used to ask them, oh, I'm going to help you, help you. But then I see I have to speak up. If I don't speak up, then other people, like other students are me, they want to also fall like this. And that's what I decided I have to speak up. And I fight against my employer, and it's still going on. But yeah, that's what my story is, that I was a migrant student, and that's what we ask government. That when we don't have permanent status, it pushes us to the other side of the world, where we have no hope, and we have to go through a lot of things. denial of health care exploitation by employers and still we fight and so Jess and Dave can you share just a little more just like a couple lines about how you're fighting despite the fact that uh, you know the current systems don't accept you know they want proof or evidence right and still we are fighting what keeps you going well what keeps me going is my teammates mm -hmm. my group people you know believe in rights stand up and fight because back home they're saying we're aligned and i talked to the minister myself and said no it happens to me too You're, and, the, and unfortunately the minister that came his dad is the, is the person sent him here mm -hmm. so i know him later on i know him so i said no i'm one of those victims i've been abused and i'm forced to become undocumented right so getting in with and what MWAC is a very, very good group, as I said. Um, I don't know why, where would I be now standing if it wasn't MWAC, because I, I came here 2021, I run off the farm, and from 2021, I am a part of MWAC, still are, you know, and I'm diverse myself in the groups, as I said, to keep active, because we are fighting for status for all, you know, not just me. So. For me, I was kind of nervous at start, but when I came with Amber, it's been, it's going to be one year soon, but in one year I'm standing here and speaking, showing confidence, it's all because of the members we have, the staff, everyone like is so helpful and like, you know, it's like a team, when we work in a team, everyone supports you and you support other, and that's how I think I was able to fight in my case and with my status. And that's how I'm going to keep fighting, keep speaking up, and keep speaking up for other people, too. We are all together, right? 